Hi, I'm Justin, a software engineer on the Flutter Framework team. Hi, I'm Greg, and I'm also a software engineer on the Flutter Framework team. And we're here to talk about adaptive user interfaces. In the past, most frameworks and apps have been built for one platform and one device type. We could continue to just support one kind of device for each app we build, but that would ignore one of Flutter's greatest strengths, cross-platform flexibility. Flutter apps can run in a lot of different places, six different platforms, different screen sizes, the web, different input devices, different languages. If we want to take advantage of it fully, we need to create a user interface that works across all of these variations. To do that, we need to create an adaptive UI. All apps respond to changes in the form of user input, but an adaptive app also responds to the state of the environment. This creates an app that feels natural to the user wherever they use the app. In this talk, we're going to give you some ideas of how to detect changes in the environment and generate adaptive user interfaces using Flutter's widgets and APIs based on our learnings from building adaptivity into Flutter itself. And we're going to show you some new additions to Flutter that can help you create great adaptive user interfaces. The major types of adaptivity include platform look and feel, like the theming of the UI, whether it's a web interface or not, or the setting of dark mode, environmental changes like view size, orientation, and platform preferences, and platform capabilities like having sensors or touch interaction. Flutter offers a media query inherited widget that provides access to information about the environment that the app is running in, similar to media queries in CSS. Because it's an inherited widget, it also automatically creates a dependency that will rebuild the given context when needed, so you don't have to worry about getting out of sync. This is what various adaptive scaffolding packages use internally to perform their adaptations. You can use this pattern to adapt to many different environmental values, such as view width, as mentioned in another Flutter Forward talk, Rodian Liam's translating design to code, which will be linked in the description of this video, orientation, user preferences like the text scale factor, brightness, like light mode and dark mode. And you can also respond to physical layout, including safe areas affected by the software keyboard or various notches on mobile devices or hinge locations on foldables. Most of these properties are available from the media query data object returned by the media query dot of call. The platform often determines the look and feel of an application, so it makes sense that Flutter applications should adapt to that experience. You can access the platform that an application is running on using the default target platform variable, or for material applications, from theme data's platform attribute. Many widgets in Flutter already automatically change their behavior based on platforms, such as overscroll indicators, scrolling behaviors, text editing context menus, and default keyboard shortcuts. Other widgets have adaptive constructors, like switch or circular progress indicator, which you can use to explicitly ask it to change its look based on the platform. For adapting to the web environment, use the constant K is web to tell if you're running in a web browser. Remember that mobile devices have web browsers too, so it's possible to have K is web be true and to be running on, say, Android. This is the actual source code of adaptive text selection toolbars build method where it decides which toolbar to render based on the current platform. You'll see similar switch statements around the Flutter source code along with occasional conditions for K is web as well. When adapting to light mode and dark mode, there are some considerations regarding the platform brightness and the theme brightness and how they interact with each other. In a material app, by default, the dark theme parameter is null, meaning that the theme will not adapt to the current brightness at all. It's always going to use the plain theme value, even when the device is in dark mode. So here I've set a basic dark theme for the app to use, and just by doing this, I automatically get the color change you see in the app here when dark mode is toggled in the device's settings. You can control this automatic theme switching when using the theme mode property on Material App. But what if I want to manually change something in the app based on the current brightness, say, like the icon that you see here? I can use the brightness value on the current theme data to check the theme's brightness. Since we're using the default theme mode behavior as mentioned above, theme data's brightness will always reflect the brightness of the platform, and I can change my icon with it in sync with the theme. If you want direct access to the platform's brightness without considering the theme, it's possible to use the brightness value from Media Query, but usually it's good practice to keep brightness in sync with your theme. Just like Media Query, themes are also based on inherited widgets, so the relevant parts of the app will rebuild reactively when the device's brightness setting changes. If you want to take a closer look at this code or play around with it yourself, this and all other code samples in this talk are linked in the description. 
For Cupertino apps, the setup is a little more manual, but the concepts are the same. Cupertino app has no theme mode property, so we'll need to switch between light and dark themes ourselves. We can do that by listening to platform brightness on widgets binding with the widgets binding observer mixin. Then we can set the brightness value on our Cupertino theme data along with any other values that we might want to change depending on light and dark mode. Now, just like with Material, we can look up the brightness via the theme and use it to change any part of the app we want, such as the icon again here. Some platforms have specific hardware capabilities, such as having a keyboard or mouse, sensors like accelerometers, or touchscreens. For determining things like whether a platform has sensors like an accelerometer, you'd refer to the documentation for the sensor plugin that you're using to get the data, such as the Flutter Favorite Sensors Plus package. Some of these things are not able to be determined until an event arrives, such as whether the user is currently using a mouse or a touchscreen. In this case, to see what kind of device produced the event, you would check the pointerdownevent.kind field if you receive the event from adding a handler to a listener, or a tapdowndetails.kind if you receive the event from a gesture detector's on tap down handler. While you're unlikely to need to worry about this in most applications, when we were implementing focus and hover highlights, we needed to adapt the input modality last used since we wanted focus and hover highlights to not be displayed other than on text fields when the user was using a touchscreen. This means that if you use a trackpad or mouse, say on a tablet device or touchscreen laptop, to move a pointer, these highlights will appear, but the moment you tap on the screen, they'll disappear again automatically. If you do need to use it, this information is exposed via focusmanager.instance.highlight mode, which will indicate whether the user last used a touch interface or a traditional mouse keyboard interface. As a convenience, Flutter provides a widget called Focusable Action Detector, which provides hooks for handling these kinds of state changes automatically. In this code sample, we use a Focusable Action Detector to change the background color of the container whenever the mouse pointer hovers over it. If the user switches to using touch input, then the hover highlight goes away automatically. So because everything is a widget in Flutter, we can really change anything we want about our app based on these kinds of environmental changes. It's just as easy to tweak a few parameters in response to a change as it is to swap out an entire chunk of the widget tree. In fact, this led to a bit of a conundrum for a team using Flutter to build a desktop app at Google recently. The designers on the project were surprised to realize that when users made the window small enough, they wouldn't just get a few minor adaptive size changes, the entire desktop app was suddenly swapped out for the mobile app. It's so easy to do something like this in Flutter that you might have to take extra care to think about how you want your app to work in a tiny desktop window. It really makes us wonder if maybe we made adaptivity too easy. Okay, now that we know what kinds of properties can be used to change the user interface in an adaptive way, let's see how we can use these properties to actually change how the user interface looks and operates. We can use media query to depend on things like window sizing. Animated builder can be used to respond to anything that is a change notifier. And layout builder allows us to change what gets built based on parent widget sizing constraints as opposed to the size of the entire window. When building your own widgets, any child widget can be made adaptive by setting the attributes for the child from the contents of a media query data object obtained by calling media query dot of. So in this code sample, we use the size attribute on media query to decide one of two sizes for the star, one for windows that are less than 800 pixels wide and one for larger windows. Because the star border is inside of an animated container, the change in size is implicitly animated. You can use an animated builder for more than just animations. If you want to update part of the UI based on a change that happened in an object that is a change notifier, just build that object as part of the builder given to an animated builder. In this example, we're building a widget that will change the border side around a child to a different border if the child or any of its descendants have the current input focus. Here, you can see that the animated builder uses a focus node for the animation that it listens to. Since a focus node is a change notifier, it will notify the animated builder each time it changes focus state. When the animated builder receives the notification, it will call its builder function again, building a new widget tree. In order to avoid rebuilding parts of the tree that don't depend on the change that it is listening to, animated builder also takes an optional child widget that is passed on to its builder function. This allows our new widget to pass in the subtree wrapped by the focus widget. And when the focus state changes, only the container inside the build function gets rebuilt, not the focus widget and its child. 
For better readability, if you're on the beta channel, you can swap out Animated Builder in this example for Listenable Builder, which has an identical implementation, but is a more appropriate name when you're not listening to an animation. If you want to change how a widget is rendered based on the space available, use Layout Builder to look at the constraints given by the parent and decide how to change your interface. In this example, we have a custom app bar that has multiple icons on it, and we want to have any icons that don't fit automatically move to an overflow menu when the header is too narrow. We use a layout builder to defer the building of the widget until the layout time to know what the exact constraints are, and then build only those icons that fit, moving the rest into the overflow menu. This is the code for the builder example in the previous slide. A layout builder makes it really easy to swap in and out entire pieces of the widget tree based on incoming constraints. Here, we calculate the number of children that can fit in the available space by evaluating the constraints using the preferred size of the widget. And here, we limit the number of children we attempt to draw to the length of the array. Then we split the list of children into those that fit and those that don't, placing the ones that don't in a separate overflow menu widget, not shown. I should mention that using a layout builder can bypass some of Flutter's change detection code, causing extra layout and paint passes. So it's not for every situation, but the performance implications are usually small. If performance is critical, implementing a custom render object can both give you more control over rebuilds and more control over painting and layout at the cost of slightly more complex code. If you'd like more information, check out another Flutter Forward talk, Rody and Liam's Translating Design to Code, which will be linked to this video's description. In that talk, they discuss adapting the layout to different conditions. Flutter continues to add more ways to help your application feel native on all platforms. Here are a few recent additions that you might not have used yet. The context menus that typically appear on text selection are now fully customizable, and an adaptive widget helps you easily build them with the native look and feel of any of Flutter's supported platforms. Cascading menus like you see on desktop menu bars can now be created in Flutter with full support for keyboard accelerators. And the Flutter Adaptive Scaffold package was recently released, and it provides a high-level way to change the layout of your app based on screen size breakpoints. With just a bit of configuration data, Adaptive Text Selection Toolbar can automatically build a native-looking selection menu on all of Flutter's supported platforms. Thanks to built-in adaptivity, this allows you to quickly build and customize these menus without having to worry about visual differences across platforms. Here we've added a custom button to the text selection toolbar in this text field. Whichever platform we run this on, we'll see our button appear in the native looking menu for the platform without needing to specify anything about the look and feel for the platform ourselves. Here in the context menu builder parameter, I can return any widget to be used as the text field's context menu. In this case, I'm returning our Adaptive Text Selection Toolbar widget. Instead of specifying the toolbar's buttons as widgets as well, the button items constructor lets me just give their labels and callbacks while using the default appearance for the current platform. So I pass in the default button items, as well as my custom button item at the end. And so you can see that regardless of what platform or what the current default buttons are, I will get my custom button appended at the end with everything looking like the default style for the platform. The menu bar widget can be used to make a desktop style menu bar that can be placed anywhere in the widget tree and populated with menu items that are either built-in widgets designed to look like standard menu items or custom items that are simply composed of widgets like anything else in Flutter. The built-in menu items handle accelerators, keyboard traversal, and display localized adaptive shortcut labels, but you can build those into your custom menu items too. The same customizable cascading menus can also be used outside of a menu bar using a menu anchor widget. In this example, we've created a menu bar that includes an about menu item that shows the about box and a quit menu item. Here we define the sub menu using the sub menu button widget. And here are its children. The shortcuts defined here are used to determine the label to show in the menu item button. You bind that same shortcut to an action elsewhere, perhaps using the shortcut registry. The menu accelerator is determined by the menu accelerator label, and the character that defines the accelerator is preceded by an ampersand, which is why you see them in the labels here. The menu accelerator label automatically strips them when on platforms that don't use accelerators. For macOS, Flutter also provides the platform menu bar widget, which creates a native macOS menu instead of a Flutter rendered menu. 
Flutter's Adaptive Scaffold is a high-level layout widget that can respond to view geometry changes to rebuild the widget tree to match changing layout conditions based on predefined size breakpoints. It's part of the Flutter Adaptive Scaffold package published and maintained by the Flutter team. This is the example from the package, which changes from a list view to a grid view when the appropriate breakpoints are satisfied. This example shows the portion of the build function with layouts for breakpoints.small and breakpoints.medium and up. In the future, you'll be able to have your application provide multiple separate windows based on the platform or form factor it's running on. There's another Flutter Forward talk on this upcoming feature called Preview, Multiple Windows on Desktop by Michael Goderbauer that you might want to take a look at if you're interested in this. It's linked in the description of this video. So here are some takeaways to remember. Look to Media Query for environmental state and let it notify you when it changes. Animated Builder responds to all kinds of change notifiers, not just animations. Use Layout Builder when you want to change what is built based on the layout constraints. Use default target platform and Kaya's web to determine the platform you're running on. And finally, look at the pointer device kind to know how the user is interacting with your app. Now you know how to detect and respond to changes in the application environment like view size, orientation, current platform, and platform preferences and capabilities. Flutter gives you the power to quickly build apps across many different platforms, and while that might feel daunting at first, it also provides the signals and flexibility needed to create natural feeling experiences in each environment. Be sure to check out all the other interesting talks at Flutter Forward, and as always, check the video description for links to everything covered in the talk. Thank you.